Welcome to the One Stop Systems presentation at NovelCon 17. First of all, the important disclaimers and cautions regarding forward-looking statements. I'm David Ron. I'm president and CEO of One Stop Systems. I've been on the board of directors since 2016. We went public in 2018. We elected to make a change to the CEO earlier this year in February. I took over in an interim role and then uh, the full-time position in June. It's great to be part of this team. I'd like to introduce two other people that are on the call with me today. First of all, John Morrison with over 30 years of experience. He joined us slightly before the IPO in 2018. And Jim Eisen, who's been at the company the longest period of time, great experience in this area. He's Chief Sales and Marketing Officer. So what are we about? We're about bringing the performance of the data center to the edge, the very edge, when you can't wait for the cloud. If you look at these five photos, these are all applications out on the edge that are run in AI and need enormous computing power out there on the, on the very edge. So what's this all about? It's when action needs to take place now. So we have all these sensors, we have all this data, we have to acquire that data, we store it, compute, and then most importantly, take action on it. In the field, at the edge, when now is all the time you have. So what do we do, what, what do we provide to the market? Well, these are our basic building blocks for edge computing that we offer to the marketplace. First of all, expansive IO, since you've got all that data coming in, you have to acquire, you need the highest performance, lowest latency type networking. Flash array storage, our focus is on the highest performance, high density, and in some interesting form factors. Servers, we tend to build custom servers for different applications that can handle harsh environments. And then GPU compute accelerators. These things can be loaded up with 16 or more of the latest NVIDIA GPUs, for example. Our slogan is performance without compromise at the edge. We like to call this AI on the fly. So again, this is bringing the power of the data center to the very edge without any compromise on performance. And that's our value proposition to the market. We bring that high speed processing, the expansive IO, the low latency networking, and the high density solid state. But a lot of people do that. What we do is allowing you to operate that not in your air conditioned building at the data center, or even on that air conditioned building out on the edge. But these are for these environments where the world's a little more harsh. So we build products that can stand up to that, that are in compact and special form factors, and we put different types of specialization into them. At the end of the day, it's all about producing actionable intelligence in real time, on site, at the point of data acquisition. So who cares? What's the relevance? Well, think about it, whether you're a submarine hunter over the Pacific looking for enemy subs, or you're in your autonomous vehicle, worried about hitting a car or a person. In both cases, you need the processing power of a data center on site. There is no room to go back to the data center for a reaction. I'd like to now touch a little bit more on the applications uh, for, the for the company. First of all, earlier this month, we introduced um, our fourth design win at a major military contractor. This is an exciting time for us because we continue to proliferate within this military uh, contractor. Our first design was ground-based missile defense system. Second was a data storage unit. So this is very high density um, solid state memory that can be put into an aircraft. And later they decided, hey, we need a whole data center in the sky. So they added the computing power. And then more recently, um, higher density, more servers, more GPU, 
um, all put to allow the highest performing uh, performance out in the field in things like aircrafts. Second large market segment for us is media and entertainment. Now, pre-COVID, this was when you went to the concert and those great lighting shows that were in the back, the videos playing in the back, um, a lot of those were using our equipment. Now today, in the COVID world, that's shift. It's pivoted to the virtual world. And that's anything from those same music artists with a uh, virtual background. Um, for example, like Katy Perry there, which was on American Idol, featuring the technology, or up above where you have a 3D screen or three panels that the computer and the AI work with closely so that those lines and separations between the three lines, three screens are entirely removed and it looks like you're really out in the forest. So we've talked a little bit about these first two markets. First of all, the military. What's our vision in the military? Our vision is the entire wartime theater of tomorrow is gonna to require AI to be in every tank, helicopter, aircraft, ship, everything. And that's gonna require high performance computing like we offer. And it's not gonna be that standard um, rack that you can put into that air conditioned data center. You need something to be able to fit into that space, deal with the power issues and deal with the harsh environment. We've talked about the media and entertainment space. This is one that in, we were impacted in 2020 on our revenue. Um, but fortunately, uh, our customer is pivoting strong in this area. And we expect them to come back strong later this year. Commercial aircraft, which includes networking systems, entertainment systems, and most importantly, the biggest focus these days is on safety systems. Autonomous vehicles. Now, first reaction when you hear autonomous vehicles, you think about the car you may buy four or five years from now. Um, although we're focused and engaged in that marketplace, we see the bigger opportunity for ourselves as everything else that will go autonomous. Trucks, buses, tanks, all kinds of different vehicles that will require enormous, high, enormous computing performance. And then rounding out a couple other markets, um, instrumentation and medical. So if you try to size where we're at, and where we play, um, we definitely are doing high performance computing, but again, since we're not going into the data center air condition and it tends to be on the edge, we're really that, that uh, section between. And uh, for example, if you have an IOT device on your refrigerator, that's not where we play. We're at the very high performance. And then on top of that, it's the specialization that we just talked about, ruggedization, being able to be in a portable, portable portable vehicle, those type of things. If you, would, if you want to take a look at, you know, what is our technical expertise? What do we do different? Well, first of all, we have a solid group of engineers that when you look at the core of the company, it gets back to we're really good at high performance, low latency switch fabrics. Why is this important? If you're going to put these different things together, and you're going to do them at the highest performance, you be, have to be able to handle that in the latest technologies. This includes PCI Express Gen 4 and NVLink, NV -Link, which is a proprietary technology from NVIDIA that we're licensed uh, to do designs with. And one of the things from my background, I used to be at a company called PLX, I used to sell these switches. Um, we saw customers all the time struggling with signal integrity at these high performance levels. So we offer a lot of value, clean that up, and make sure people can get their products to market. And that enables a lot of the products we talked about, including being able to put like 16 of the latest GPUs into a single box and offer 100 times the performance of a standard CPU, or solid state memory, loading it up with uh, the highest performance to offer higher performance, lower latency, um, than you can get from a standard spinning hard drive. But if you talk, when we, when we talk about performance without compromise, compromise, I want to get back to the fact that we're talking about these are tend to be in very harsh and challenging environments. Whether it's the trunk of a car or autonomous vehicle where you need that data center, 
you've got challenges like, how do you cool this thing? How do you get enough power to this thing? Um, it's not just about putting racks in there. That doesn't work. Or in an aircraft, where aircraft are constantly monitoring their fuel efficiency so weight and power are important. And also for the wartime theater, they don't want to lose any performance um, because the electronic equipment in there is sucking up too much power. And then ruggedization. And that ranges anything from the helicopter in the desert, the dust dealing with that and the vibration, to the roadies that are carrying servers to do those backdrop light shows um, and screens, the same ones that are putting the amplifiers on and they love to drop off the truck from 10 feet. They have to survive. And then special form factors, all types of different special form factors. Sometimes it's as simple as the depth is much less or we put it in a 2U versus a 4U, um, but it goes much beyond that. Here's a list of our customers. What you'll see is a representation of the uh, military space autonomous vehicles, instrumentation, and the media and entertainment space in addition to flight. So let's talk about the company's performance over the years. First of all, on the right, you see the company has had nice revenue growth. And um, we're proud of that, we felt good about it, um, but at the same time, as one of the members of the board of directors, we were concerned about a number of things. We had a uh, real good CEO that was a good founder, but didn't really make the transition to the public markets. While the NASDAQ was going up, our stock was going down. Our expectations were missed and our volume was low. We had margins, profitability and cash issues. And there was some question whether we were focused enough on certain market segments. And then we got hit by COVID-19. But rather than survive in COVID-19 during this period of time, the management team took steps to, to build a solid foundation for this company for the future. First of all, we've been uh, expanding our customer base as we were too dependent on a few customers. We have brought in a number of new customers thanks to Jim Eisen and his sales team, and that layered in an additional $12 million of revenue this year to help offset the downside of COVID in the media space. We elected to make the change of leadership in February, which included putting myself in this role. We wanted to focus on efficiency. We reduced about $2.5 to $3 million in annual spending. And we did a reorganization of the company to put more focus on market leadership, vision, profitability, gross margin, and all those types of important things. We were uncomfortable or our cash position, especially in the world of COVID, it was important we could survive if this thing went on for years. So uh, John Morrison led the leading and we raised uh, $4 million of debt. And finally, the board of directors, we went from a small board of directors um, to one that has uh, four males, three females, six independent members, and we also meet the, the ethnic diversity and gender diversity requirements of California for 2023. This is a great group of board, it's a great group of directors. I enjoy working with them. Uh, they sure hold me accountable, but uh, they're smart people and uh, have the best interests of the company in mind, which should be the case. I'm going to wrap up here with two slides. We've talked a little bit about this. So, you know, the company has uh, done well on revenue, but we have been more recently focused on other areas to not only bring in higher revenue in the future, but focus on a number of other areas. Um, and I think, you know, our opinion is that some of the that is starting to show up. Although our revenue in Q3 of this year was down 2 million because of COVID versus last year, I think you'll see that we made improvements in all the other indicators. Our spending was seven, down 700K in the quarter. Our gross margin increased from 34 to 38%. EBITDA and net income both went up. Cash got up to 5.5 million. We were under 2 million at one point and we beat our uh, guidance. So we're pleased with these early indicators, but we have a lot more to do. 
That brings me to the stock. At the end of the day, we're here to create shareholder value. Here's a map of the last year. We started the year at 202. We announced our earnings, uh, which was the record revenue, and the stock came up to about 280. Um, the board of directors decided to make a change in leadership. Um, this was before COVID hit, you know, it was kind of just this rumor over in China. Um, then COVID hit, it hit us hard. We got down as low as 59 cents a share in one of the middle of one of the trading days. And then we've been working on right sizing, reorganizing the company, cash, and improving the board. And I commented about the, the earnings call recently where we showed some of these indicators. Fortunately, since then, the stock has appreciated up above the four part $4 mark um, at the end of the year. And uh, more recently, is in the 450 range. So my last slide here, just the takeaways. Um, we're in a fast growing, exciting edge computing market. You know, our whole focus is to bring the performance of the data center to the edge without compromise and performance. And uh, we have a growing customer base. We believe we've made some hard decisions and executed some changes. And, um, you know, we're focused on growth, gross margin, profitability, and shareholder value moving forward. Um, I appreciate your time and I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you, David. Great presentation. Uh, good morning. This is Joe Gomes, the Noble Analyst on One Stop Systems. We're going to start the Q&A session here. If you wish to ask a question, please click on the lower right corner of the video window. Um, let's start off, David. You know, we, we talked about you know, the COVID impact uh, on the company in 2020. I mean, where, where do you think we're standing right now? I mean, how much more or how much longer do you think we're going to be impacted uh, by COVID here before you get to a more normalized uh, type of a, a operating environment for one stop? Yeah, although I'd like to be more optimistic, I think the reality of what's going on, even with the vaccine, we're talking about the second half of the year. Um, and But our job in between now and then, like I said before, is not to survive, but to find new customers and new opportunities, and that's what we're doing. Okay. And you, you talked a little bit about the the military customer where you've now gotten into four different programs there. You know, what is driving um, one stop success with this customer? You know, is there additional um, contracts that you can get at this one particular customer? And are you being able to use that as a springboard to get into other uh, military programs in addition to this customer? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, within this customer, we have multiple other pending opportunities that will work in real time, very close to them, just like these. We're optimistic they will close and move forward and uh, layer in additional revenue for the future. Um, we do have other activity at other military customers. They're not to this extent right now, but that's a big focus of Jim and his team is figuring out how we leverage this at the other uh, military accounts. And so we are focused on that. And I think that's something that you see more of the benefit from the second half of this year or next year. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really key and interesting. You, you talk about here in the military and, and going to, you know, more AI on the fly and digitization. You know, that's a, a key focus a lot on the, in the military budgets. Um, and, and, you know, growing, as you said, across all areas of the military. Is there any concern um, about any potential maybe slowdown there under the new uh, administration? Well, I definitely don't have all the answers, but my perspective is the following. Um, if uh, the budget is reduced, which I'm sure it will be, um, I think it's going to be reduced more. They're not going to launch new battleships and that kind of thing. I think it's more they're gonna take the equipment they have and recognize they have to get AI and all these nodes in the wartime theater, or they're not gonna be competitive with China and Russia. And so that's how I view it. I think they're gonna focus on this area uh, uh, more than they will the actual metal. Um, they'll focus more on electronics. That's my perspective. Okay, thank you for that. And let, let's switch gears a little bit to disguise. Um, we all know anyone that's been following the company, they were, you know, your largest customer, um, 
you know, because of COVID, you know, none of us have been able to go to a concert or, you know, just recently here, we've been able to go to some football games. Uh, really has hurt their business. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what Disguise has done uh, in order to mitigate that? You know, there were some uh, accounts receivables delays with them. How is the progress going there and, and, and you know, uh, one stop getting paid from Disguise and, and kind of just what you see for that business going forward? Yeah, I mean, it was an interesting time because it hit them hard and as a result hit us hard. Um, and, you know, there were some points where we were concerned, but, uh, you know, with the, the whole team focused on it, working closely with them, including me working closely with their CEO, we've got through it. We brought the AR down dramatically. They are now under their credit limit on the AR, um, which is where we wanted to get, get them. Um, the inventory has been brought down. They're working closely with us. And um, although we do not believe, you know, in the short term, um, um, we're going to be selling the equipment that's going into the large gathering events, they've pivoted very strong on this virtual product um, and doing very well. In fact, if you go to the, their website, which I visited last night again, I noticed that you barely even see the large gathering stuff on their website. It's all about the virtual products today. And there's a lot of pull there, and we're starting to see that that pull on our side. So I'm very proud of the team, how they handled this, um, because this is always a, a challenge type envi environment. But um, they, we got through it, and um, we feel good where we're at with them today. Okay. Thank you for that. And let's, let's take one from the audience here. Um, it's kind of a two-part question. Which end user markets are most promising to you? And are they all providing the same gross margin? Uh, so I, th I think the most promising ones remain in the three areas we talked about the most would be the military, uh, the media and entertainment with the more of the virtual platforms and eventually the gatherings, um, and the autonomous vehicles. And I, I stress with autonomous vehicles, you have to think beyond the space of just the consumer automobile that you might buy for $50,000 five years from now. So I think it's those three. Um, historically, the margins are higher on the military side than the commercial side, which would be the media and entertainment. Um, the autonomous vehicle side's been decent, and I think really the challenge with all of these is continuing to, you know, improve our value proposition and our barriers to entry and all of that, and that's what we're focused on doing. Okay. And you mentioned, you know, the company continues to win a number of these million-dollar-plus awards. And then maybe you could talk a little bit more about those, you know, with whom are you winning these awards, what, for what type of applications, what do they mean to OSS, you know, how quickly do these awards turn into revenue um, for the company? Yeah. So first of all, on the applications, it's a lot of the ones we just talked about, but then it, it goes out into some of the medical the instrumentation, some test equipment. Um, those type of applications. We think the biggest concentration moving forward will be anything that has to do with some kind of uh, portability. So it's whether it's a piece of equipment you have to move or a vehicle you have to move, I think that's where we'll get most of our wins. Um, I'm trying to remember the second part of your question. You know, talking about you know how are, you know what what are advantages that it um, is always as bringing that are enabling you to win these, you know what how does this mean for OSS here not only in the near term you know how quickly do you turn these into revenue? That's right. Sorry about that. So our our you know from the time uh, that we engage with a customer, get them to a commit to production. Uh, on the commercial side, it's six to nine months. Usually on the military side, it could be 18 months. Um, I will say that um, Jim is pretty conservative when he claims a win. Um, it means we have a financial commitment, meaning they bought something, they're moving forward. So it's not like, you know, hey, they said they're going to probably use our product or they're going to use it. They've actually made a financial commitment. So when we claim these wins, just a clarification, we always like to point out these wins are the million dollars is we expect them to generate at least a million dollars over a four-year period. Many of them generate much more than that, and the average for the most part is above the million dollar mark, but just, just a qualifier. Okay, thanks for that. 
you know, who, who would you consider, again, in some of these um, RFPs that, that you're bidding on as your key competitors? I mean, you know, oftentimes, as you guys have mentioned, it's, you know, in-house. Um, but who else out there do you see in and out on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as, as a competitor? Yeah, so number one for most of them is in-house. And I know that's kind of a stale answer, but um, and but that's the reality. And so the challenge there is really offering something we convinced that we're you know better equipped to do. Um, one of the questions we get about the military space is that we think uh, you know budget tightening in the military space might even help us because they may downsize their engineering crews and go you know more to the outside. Um, but then you know beyond that, it tends to be a, a broad. Uh, base of different competitors. Um, there's not one that we see every day. Okay. And obviously, you mentioned, you know, in the past, the company had made some acquisitions. Um, what kind is your, your stance on acquisitions today? Um, is it something you continue to look for? Is it be, if so, is it more of a bolt-on? Is it more of a transformation of um, acquisition, um, or is it, you know, hey, let's let's just stick to where we are for right now until we get through these challenges, and then we can can think again about the acquisition outlook. Yeah, good question. So um, the acquisitions we did after the IPO were focused on uh, a number of things, one being revenue, uh, increasing revenue, uh, which we did. Um, now we're more in a state where we're really – trying to refine who we're going to be in the future and our vision plan. How do we firm up our value proposition to, to the next level? Um, and so when I think about M&A now, it's more about how do we fill holes in a strategy that could yield, you know, enormous returns and uh, more of a one plus one equals three mentality. Um, and, um, but that's probably not going to take place in the short term. We're, you know, we're, we're focused on executing uh, operationally, bringing in new customers, getting out of this COVID thing, and, um, and, and then refining that, that strategy. Okay. And kind of, you know, a follow-on um, with the, the, the whole COVID, and you had mentioned this in, in the report. Now, how comfortable are you with your current liquidity you know, as you look forward to where you think the company could be growing in 2021, are, are you still comfortable there? Or is that something that, you know, you'll still be looking at, at pretty hard? Yeah, so we're, we're comfortable with our liquidity right now. Um, you know, we've uh, built the, the cash up to 5.5 million. As mentioned, it was low as under two. We have access to more. We don't intend to pull it. Um, and I think it's just about we're going to run tight, lean, efficient, uh, changing the culture in the company to be able to do that. And uh, when we make the invest investments, they're going to be real solid and, and thought out carefully. So I'm very comfortable with where we're at today. Okay. And, and what do you think are, are you know, the biggest challenges for the company to achieve you know, its goals today? Well, I think it's it's really in this environment getting, you know, COVID behind us is one, um, just so we can you know, get that behind us because it has impacted us. Two is um, just continuing to bring in the new designs and the revenue um, and um, and carving out, you know, some leadership positions to at a stronger level. I mean, that's what, when I wake up in the middle of the night, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about, I'm, I'm not worried about us going out of business or anything like that. I'm worried, how do we get to the next level? And that's where we're focused. How do we make this company one that can continue to grow and produce, you know, solid profitability and shareholder value over time? Okay. Excellent. Would, would uh, either you or, or John like to share some of your goals for revenue growth or margins? Why don't I let uh, John do it? It was a hint. I haven't let those guys talk. John? Uh yeah, at this point in time, we um, we will re be reporting our earnings uh, March the 25th, uh, along with um, filing of our 10K. Um, I will tell you that we are planning growth for next year, uh, both at the uh, top line level as well as at the margin level. 
And I think uh, our investors will be pleasantly surprised given that we still believe that COVID will impact the first half of our year significantly. Well, great. I think that's all the questions we have here. I really I want to uh, take a moment here to thank you, David, John, and Jim, uh, for joining us in this excellent presentation. And we look forward to hearing you know, how the fourth quarter is and, and the goals will be on the 325 earnings call. Thanks again, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.